So <laughs> thanks for a reminder of that. This is one of my big foibles as we record these sessions and Richard's already authorized us to do this. We record these sessions and we later post them to our CARE website for, for students who maybe are in class or stakeholders in a different time zone that are unable to attend. So we appreciate you allowing us to do that, Richard. Uh, a couple quick announcements that we'll make here um, is uh, we have some upcoming events and, and, and thanks for attending today's um, Zoom-based seminar provided by Dr. Richard Mankin. But on September 22nd, uh, from 12 to 1.30, we're gonna have a Zoom-based what we're calling a CARE All Hands um, gathering which is gonna be open to other, uh, to any faculty, to any students who are really interested in acoustics on our campus. Um, and so uh, we, we are opening that up to all of our stakeholders to kind of provide an update of what we've done over the last year and where we're going heading forward into the future. So um, the Zoom link is noted here. We'll also send out announcements. We'll likely have a link to this on our CARE website as well. So if you're um, available and would like to attend and learn more about our Center for Acoustic Research and Education here at UNH, then we would certainly invite you to attend. Uh, Richard, if you could forward your slide one time here, we'll say a little bit more about our future seminars uh, coming up. We have, uh, Richard's our first one. I, I think you can, there you go. Um, Richard is providing our first seminar today, and I'll do a formal introduction of him in just a second, but in October, uh, 13th, and these are all from noon to, to 1 uh, p.m. Eastern, so second Tuesday of every month. Uh, we have Susan Parks from Syracuse who's going to be giving a talk on, on uh, whale communication. Uh, on uh, the 10th of November, we have uh, Dr. Brian Elbing from Oklahoma State University who's going to be talking about how we use sound to detect and characterize tornadoes. Uh, and then our last seminar for the semester will be the 8th of December, uh, where we have our new care research scientist, Madi. Al Badrawi, who's giving a talk on underwater acoustic analysis. And so we hope we can, you can join us for as many of these as, as uh, you're able to. And uh, at this time, I guess I'll do a quick intro uh, of Richard, who's giving our talk today. We appreciate you being here. Um, Dr. Richard Mankin is a research entomologist at the USDA uh, uh, Research Service in Gainesville, Florida. So he's on the campus of the University of Florida. He's in the Insect Behavior and Biocontrol Research Unit. Uh, his research is focused on the detection of hidden infestations of insects in stored products uh, in wood and in soil using acoustic detection methods. And you'll talk about that today. Uh, he's also interested in insect communication and has conducted studies in ins insect acoustic, vibrational, and pheromonal communication with applications to pest management. Dr. Mankin also works closely with researchers at the University of Florida and has served on the advisory committees of students in the Department of Entomology, uh, biology and electrical engineering, and in fact, was a co-advisor on uh, uh, the committee of my, my new uh, AES postdoc, Baruch Rudy. His talk today is entitled Examples of Insect Pest Detection and Mating Disruption for Agroacoustics. And so uh, all of you that are online today, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Mankin as the opening act of our fall 2020 edition of our UNH Care Acoustics Seminar. Thank you for, for joining us today, Richard. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm happy to be here speaking to you today. Uh, I've been a couple times in New Hampshire, but, but never at the University of New Hampshire. And uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so I should explain that uh, this, this is mostly uh, about uh, equipment. And the reason why is because uh, at the beginning of 2019, uh, the, the person who ran the company that I had been purchasing acoustic detection equipment from for uh, about uh, 18 years, uh, he, uh, he died of cancer and his, uh, his company closed down. So, so a lot of the work that I had been doing uh, with particular instrumentation uh, was no longer, uh, the, the instruments were no longer available for pur pur purchase and I could uh, use the e equipment until it uh, stopped working. But as every, well, ho hopefully everybody knows when you work in the field, 
the equipment you work with uh, a, a lot of times uh, develops issues and stops working and then you have to repair it or, or replace it. it. It's just part of uh, field work. Uh, af after four or five years, most of the, most of the equipment needs needs to be replaced because field work is harsh uh, on electronics. Uh, so I'm going to start off with just a, a short description of different kinds of e equipment I've worked with over the years. And let's see. Let me let me make sure. Does everybody see my cursor or? Uh, if not, yes, if not, you can see I'll the just, cursor. Uh, hmm? You can see the cursor, yes. Okay. Okay, so this uh, instrument here, whoops, <laughs> now I have to go back. Okay, was uh, the AED 2000 and 2010 uh, different versions. Uh, I have used that a lot in field work because it's uh, relatively compact compared to, say, uh, accelerometer systems. I mean, here's a B and K, a couple of B and K accelerometers that I really like to use, uh, particularly in the laboratory, but, but they're harder to, to use in the field uh, because, for example, the, the wiring is, is easy to uh, disturb and break or, or uh, wind will blow on it and, and move things around and, and make uh, static and stuff like that. But uh, this kind of equipment is fairly expensive uh, on the order of 3000 to 3500 and most persons who are not uh, uh, acoustic specialists will will not want to be buying equipment like that that they might only use once or twice uh, and and more people would like to say buy something for three hundred uh, three fifty than uh, three five hundred and uh, so most of my career i 've also been interested in not only working with the equipment that 's available but also devising new equipments such as uh, using the, the board you see over here on the, the right that uh, I helped develop for working with uh, Asian citrus psyllid uh, communication vibrations uh, and uh, ended up developing a system that would detect the signal from uh, a calling mail signal, calling mail psyllid, and reply back with a female psyllid reply, and and that would uh, attract the male to to the site of the uh, the place where the speaker was uh, signaling from, and and so you could trap the males that way, and uh, and you can also use it this kind of uh, approach for mating disruption. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking more about that at the end of the talk. Okay, here are some other sensors. Uh, one uh, that I labeled PDS, uh, that is a pest detection system that I'll talk about in a little greater detail. Uh, this, this one also costs about, about $300. And it uh, it uses uh, electret uh, microphones, uh, which uh, which are fairly. Strong, although in field use, I've I've found that they only last uh, three or four years before something bad happens. And then over here on the right, uh, you see the the AED system that I worked with before in a little deep more detail on the side of a avocado tree. I, I did an experiment in Southern Florida. Those of you who uh, eat avocados uh, probably know that uh, th there are of uh, insects that, that would like to eat avocado trees. And uh, uh, we've been working with uh, the, the farmers there to uh, 
to detect and figure out the best way for those insects. Uh, it's got uh, a sensor probe here that is fairly sturdy. Uh, most of them last for a long time until you drop them and then it'll, it'll break the uh, piezoelectric uh, uh, sensor and, and you have to get a new one. And then uh, most also, I work, I uh, record the signals and then go back and analyze them in, in greater detail. And you'll see some uh, of the kinds of analyses I've been doing uh, coming up. Okay, also we have uh, systems that uh, detect insects in trees. I worked a lot with red palm weevil in uh, tropical areas. Uh, they don't have palm trees in uh, in New Hampshire, probably, but but this is a very important pest in subtropical re regions, uh, particularly with uh, date date palms and coconut palms. And uh, these these are all new systems that cost about three hundred dollars. Uh, one thing I I would mention is that it hasn't really been worked out yet how robust they are in field use. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking based on my experience, uh, the, these kinds of things will go for about maybe three years before they start breaking down in field use. Uh, and one of my, uh, the newest ones is something called a uh, tree vibes sensor system. Uh, I call it, I labeled it TVS. And it, it has its own uh, solar panel that will help, help uh, keep it charged up so that you can leave it, say, on a tree there over on the left for periods of uh, uh, years and have it collect signals and uh, send them uh, over the internet to, to a central location. And this, uh, as it turns out, also works for stored product insects. I have here a bunch of uh, rice weevils uh, in, in a pint jar, and it does a really good job of, of, uh, of listening to those. And, and I'll be discussing that too in a little bit. Okay, so the... Uh, system I had labeled uh, PDS uh, uh, back a few slides ago. Uh, I wanted to describe that in a little more detail. Uh, it does, it's got an electret microphone uh, that goes to a, a, the signal goes to a preamp. The, uh, we have to filter out signals uh, below uh, 60 Hertz, uh, uh, a lot of times, uh, most of the time. And then uh, we also have to uh, filter out signals at, uh, that are greater than half of the digitization rate. Uh, in this case, the PDS system, its digitization rate is uh, 10 uh, kilohertz. So, so we don't uh, look at signals greater than uh, 5,000. Hertz, uh, in order to uh, avoid an aliasing the signals. And uh, uh, this is all controlled uh, by uh, a small microcontroller in the, in the system. It's, it's all battery operated. Uh, this system can run about a day without, without having to, to be recharged or uh, batteries replaced. And uh, the signals that it collects are saved onto a memory card and then you can take the memory card and, and put it on your computer and look at the data that way. And this is a, a very useful system for research. Uh, I think it, it probably also would be useful uh, 
two farmers uh, who are uh, technologically adept. If they if most most farmers nowadays have computers and connections to the internet, and uh, so would would benefit from collecting the data and t taking a look at it at the end of the day. Uh, the two insects I'm going to talk about the most uh, the rest of the day uh, are the uh, red, oh wow, I did this wrong. Cytophilus aryopsi is with the rice weevil. <laughs> and I, I messed that up when I put that on. Okay, so Tribolium castanium, castanium is actually this red flower beetle down here. And Cytophilus aryzi is uh, this uh, funny looking weevil here. Uh, they're both uh, big pests. Uh, the, the rice weevil is a big pest of wheat and the uh, red flower beetle is a big pest of flour. The signals that they make in in grain or flour uh, look a, a lot like you see here in this slide. And I, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, looking at acoustic slides, but, but this would be an oscillogram where the, the amplitude of the signal is uh, on the vertical axis. The time is uh, on the horizontal axis. And, and you have these little spikes that show up as little clicks uh, to the ear when you're listening to it on headphones. And the frequencies, the, this, this is a Cytophilus aryzi uh, insect. Uh, most of the signals are below three kilohertz. Uh, and, and they're very broad band be, because uh, just basically they're, they're either impacts of the legs hitting the, the wheat or uh, feeding activities uh, with, with the, uh, the, the mandibles. And so these are just kind of broadband signals with, with that much definition to them. And uh, I should point out that the darker the signal here is in, in the uh, spectrogram, the, the more energy the signal has. And the frequency on the spectrogram is, is on this axis here. And time, time is on the horizontal axis again. Uh, you'll see a bunch of these and, and they'll, they'll be similar. Okay. I put up this slide of the Tribolium castanium uh, red flower beetle signals uh, because in that particular example there was a, a background noise, uh, door closing or something like that and uh, that that got picked up by my computer program as a, as a non-insect signal and it, as you can see, it's got a different spectral characteristic, which is what, uh, what I use to distinguish the uh, insect sound from the background noise. And I, I wanted to toss that in uh, because it is not too difficult to distinguish uh, insect sounds, e even though they're broadband, uh, you can still uh, distinguish most of them by the, their short, time frame, which is say two milliseconds up to about 30 milliseconds in length and duration. And uh, uh, what you may notice is it's not easy to distinguish the, the red flower beetle from the rice weevil sounds. And that's partly um, partly because they're all generated by similar uh, similar organs uh, and the, the uh, 
the flour, <laughs> flour and the the wheat. Uh, that they're they're all the, the same organic compounds, and, and uh, so the signals are are not going to be different, except if you look at the time pattern of the the actions of the insect. And this this can be used a lot of times to distinguish uh, the, the insects from each other, and uh, it's uh, one of the the main focuses of uh, of uh, my research uh, in the last, uh, say, 10 years. I've been able to distinguish a, a lot of insects from each other using the, the patterns of activity. Okay, so those first two sets of, of signals were, uh, were done with the PDS system. And here is an example of what what happens if you look at the tree vibe system, which works with store products uh, also, e even though it's, it was developed for trees. And uh, here the, uh, I, I can point out the, the signal coming in was from a recorder that, um, that goes all the way up to, to 44.1 uh, kilohertz sampling rate so so we can go up to higher frequencies but but as you can see most most of the action uh, is as as we found with the PDS system the the signals mostly are below about two kilohertz uh, which is true for a, a lot of uh, insect movement sounds and uh, A lot of times what I'll do is come up with a profile of the insect sound, which would be sort of an average of a group of uh, 50 to 1,000 sounds that uh, can be used as, as a way to uh, help identify which insect you're working with or whether it's an insect or some other kind of background noise. And with uh, Tribolium castanea, which is the dotted line, and, and the Cytophilus psoriasi, the, the solid line, you, you can see that they have similar peaks. They're a little bit different. Uh, in, in general, you can't use the spectrogram information, the, the uh, spectral information to, uh, to tell them apart. And uh, in the case of, of working with the uh, tree vibes, I had an opportunity to get, uh, get a sample of about a thousand uh, sound. And, and so that this looks a lot smoother, but essentially uh, it's it's the same thing. It, there, there's just uh, uh, it's smoother because there's there's a thousand insects instead of uh, I mean a thousand sounds instead of uh, fifty sounds. But but otherwise you still see the same peak uh, uh, below below two thousand hertz. Uh, there there does happen to be another peak up up around uh, 7,000 hertz. Uh, my guess is it has to do with, uh, you noticed it was in a uh, jar. And uh, I, I think that the, the jar kind of acts like an organ pipe and you get, uh, you, uh, you get harmonics showing up in, in the system that way. Okay, so I, I put this up to show that the two kinds of systems can give you similar results. Uh, for example, I, I tested both systems, the PDS and the TVS, the tree vibes, with 
uh, Cycophilus psoriasi and, uh, and did several tests with, I had either 50, 10, or five insects in, in a jar. And uh, in the case of the PDS, uh, I had uh, three replications uh, for each, each of these data points. And for the TVS, I had, uh, I had those, I had three different jars, but I was able to do tests uh, on four days over a three week period. So, so it had a lot of extra replications. And uh, the, uh, the sound rate per insect is is very similar with uh, the uh, Cytophilus psoriasi uh, in in the two systems, and and that uh, that's a good sign because if they were a lot different, then I would think that one of the systems wasn't like working correctly to uh, to pick up to pick up the sounds. Now over here on the right, I have <coughs> signals collected with the uh, the, the one specifically designed for the, the uh, post-harvest detection. Uh, and it's the, the, the tribolium has a different set of behaviors than uh, Cytophilus arise and uh, it does not make as many sounds, plus the sounds are weaker because it is a pest of the flower rather than the, the wheat itself. And, and as you might guess, the sounds that are made in flower uh, are, are less intense because um, it's, it's mostly its individual movements walking around. <clears throat> Plus, this insect, uh, if you put a group of 50, uh, red flower beetles together in a jar, they're going to space out because they don't like to be that close to each other. And um, there'll, there'll be less interaction between them, whereas the, the rice weevil do, the, is, doesn't care how many there are. Uh, and so there's differences in the behavior, and in fact, they have different pheromones, things like that, that uh, make make the red flower beetle less likely to make a sound. So, so you have a, a big difference here in the in the sound rate. By the way, I was using a log uh, curve, but that that just means that it's easier to see the low rates of sounds made by them. The tribolium. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what I've been talking about till now is some some about equipment and some about the uh, behavior uh, because both of these are important to me from. Uh, ecological standpoint from a from a, a behavioral standpoint as far as understanding what's going on with the insects so that that we can work out better methods of control and working for the US Department of Agriculture a, a lot of what I do is designed specifically to, to help uh, pest managers uh, understand what the insects are doing and, and help them figure out better ways to control. And uh, I've also been working with the Asian citrus psyllid uh, in the last 10 years, which became a pest in Florida uh, that it kills um, orange trees. And it is pretty much devastated the uh, citrus industry in, in Florida. In the last 15 years, the 
amount of oranges produced in Florida has gone down by about 50% and may, may go down even further. Uh, most of, of the orange juice that we get now is, is, uh, is from, uh, from Brazil. But uh, we were trying to work out ways uh, to get the Asian citrus psyllid, which uh, to stop mating, uh, not, not because it's, it's not the killer of the tree itself. It's a disease that it carries. Uh, it, 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 uh, a, a bacterium that uh, causes uh, long, long bing, which, which uh, kills, uh, it gums up the root system and kills the tree after a while. So we were, they don't have pheromones so much, uh, but they do uh, mate using vibrational communication. Uh, the male will call, uh, the, and buzz, buzzing its wings, that, that signal gets carries, carried along the wings and uh, to, to the legs and, and then uh, along the branches to the female, the female will detect it with its legs and reply back and, and then the male will go mate with the female that way. And um, I had worked out a system with a, a postdoc that uh, picked up the signal of the mail call, let's say it's sitting here, and uh, it, it will pick it up, immediately reply back with a female call. And then it, if, if a female was over here, uh, it, it really, the signal from the buzzer uh, of the, uh, of the Ar Arduino device makes uh, a signal that is typically louder than, than what the female puts out. So it outcompetes the, the female and the male will go to the buzzer and, and get tracked, for example, in, instead of going to the female. And, and so you can use this to uh, disrupt mating and you can also just put out periodic signals uh, that interfere with the ability of the male to detect the female if it calls. And uh, this has been shown to work in the laboratory. And the problem I have is, uh, un unfortunately, the system so far costs more money to, uh, to use uh, in, in disruption or trapping than, than uh, than the standard uh, visual trapping systems that they use. So, so I have not tried to, to get it adopted in the field situation. But uh, it, do, it is useful for research into what can be done to, uh, to control psyllids. And, um, and it may also have some valid uh, uses, uh, for example, with the uh, spotted lanternfly that you all have, have up in, in uh, the Pennsylvania area. Uh, okay, so here is uh, just a, a close-up of the, the amplifier board. And uh, I wanted to bring up, I think it's getting, yeah, well, I still have a little bit of time. I wanted to bring up some of the behavioral studies we were doing with it because uh, as you can imagine that if you can put out signals that Inter that can can make the the males behave in in certain ways. Then this this is a good uh, way of of getting a handle on on the mating behavior of the uh, Asian citrus psyllid. And I had a question uh, of what would happen in the case where you had lots of psyllids on the trees. 
and and this is because uh, the the psyllids are small, and you have uh, the, the trees that get infested typically have thousands or tens of thousands of psyllids on them. Uh, and I was wondering uh, what we had already done for the initial studies was having individual pairs, but what would happen if you compared, uh, say, a, a small tree with five pairs of psyllids and a small tree with 50 uh, pairs of, of psyllids. Uh, and uh, we ran some tests uh, overnight to see what would happen. Now the usual mating hours are about 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And uh, oh. Oh. I was looking at the number of calls per psyllid per hour. And, I, and I, again, I was doing it on a log scale so that you can see what happens when you have just a small amount. The blue is the case where you have five pairs and the, uh, the checkered is, is when you had 50 pairs. Now what you can see here is the, when you've got lots of pairs the, uh, in, a, in a small space, most of the mating does actually occur during the mating hours, but but when you've only got a small number of pairs, like like you would have uh, early in the season when there's only just a small number of psyllids, Asian citrus psyllids around, uh, I discovered that uh, at sunrise and during the evening you had uh, a greater rate of calls and that uh, that makes me suspect that that the calling behavior may have some functions outside of mating uh, because at sunrise and sunrise and sunset there's not really uh, that much mating going on but it may be that the males are looking for where the females are simply because they they need to feed or or because they might want to mate the next the next day and uh, there's uh, uh, lots of studies like this that you can do uh, in a situation where where you can manipulate the the behaviors of, of the insects to understand their mating behavior better. And I think I will stop at that point. And let's see, maybe I, okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. You get the virtual clap. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Okay. Um, you want me to just say that anybody who has questions, um, you can either type them into the chat or you're more than welcome to unmute and identify yourself and where you're from. I also typed everybody a message in the chat. We understand during COVID times, you're probably viewing by yourself, but if you are in a group, um, let us know so we can keep track of numbers. And um, I can start out with a, a question actually. So. One of, one of the things I find fascinating here is that you know, this has very applied applications. And I know that you've talked a lot about the research, you know, the R&D that is going into this topic, agroacoustics is growing. Um, are commercial farmers or crops using these types of um, pest detection methods right now? Or how widespread is that? Or is that still more in an R&D phase? Um, uh, over the years, it has remained mostly uh, research and development, but but there is more interest uh, uh, primarily outside of the U.S. in in developing countries 
for uh, the stored product applications, stored product insects, because uh, in the subtropical, tropical areas, stored grain does not last very long. Uh, and it, with, it gets insects pretty quickly and the insects eat up everything very fast because it's warm. There's a lot of interest in having, say, scouts go out and inspect these storage facilities of the, the farmers and tell them when they're getting uh, infestations and then they'll be quick to, to like either sell the grain quickly or, or use the grain up in some way so as, as to uh, avoid losing it altogether. And it's, this is not such a problem in the US because uh, first of all, uh, al although grain used to, to be stored for long periods of time, uh, many years ago, uh, there's, there's less of that now. And most of the grain that is stored is stored up in the nor northern areas. Uh, um, Minnesota, uh, northern Iowa, places like that where they can keep the temperature down. And uh, the, so, so there's much more interest out, outside the country for, for uh, having instrumentation that, that detects the infestations. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, mention that I, I, I wanted to, <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure I didn't, is that uh, the rice weevil is an internal feeder, that is, it gets into the grain. So the immatures, the caterpillars, uh, they, they cannot be seen in the grain. It's only the adults that can be seen. And uh, this, this happens uh, with uh, particularly corn in, uh, in Africa, and uh, it also happens with rice that, that the larvae are, are, not, uh, are not visible. And, and so you don't know that your, your stored grain is being eaten up until, <laughs> until it starts falling apart. Uh, by that time, it's too late. So, there are there there are other questions that pest managers have also dealing with the behavior of the insects that uh, a lot of times uh, acoustics or or other uh, visual methods uh, cameras and and uh, drones and things like that can be useful for picking up information for the pest managers. So, so this is part of a continuum of uh, ways of expanding our eyes and ears uh, out of the fields. Well, that's cool. It's very nice to see such applied work being put forth towards, towards food. I think that's awesome. Thanks, Richard. I think I'll throw a question out there too, Jen. Uh, so I, I noticed one of your devices, was, you had it attached to a tree. Has there been much adoption for pest detection like in forestry? I think it's like the, you know, the uh, cultivated forests, either in the context of living trees, like we have emerald ash borer uh, quarantine in part of the state here. And I know that the, the sub-adults that are feeding on the wood oftentimes kind of make a feeding sound, as do pine borers, et cetera. Um, but has the forest, the field of forestry really adopted these sorts of kind of acoustic biosurveillance techniques either for stands, standing uh, trees or maybe for, for lumber that's already been cut? Okay, so uh, not, not so much for 
detection, but for the study of emerald ash borer behavior. For example, I worked with someone in uh, Michigan at uh, the forestry lab there a few years ago to, to look at the methods that the parasitoids used to attack the emerald ash borer. And a uh, study was done on that. And uh, there, there's been a few other uses along that line. Now, basically, you're not, you're not going to get very far moving from tree to tree with a, a sensor system. It, there's just too many trees. Uh, although the emerald ash borer has really done done a, a number of, <laughs> has killed off a large number of emerald, I mean, of, uh, of ashes. I, I guess, do you have those in, North, in uh, New Hampshire also? We do, in parts of the state, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I saw there was a, a Louise Roberts did a chat question down there. I don't know if I can get to it. Yeah, I can, I can be I, the mom. Okay, go ahead. I was going to do that. Go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. So, so Louise at Cornell has asked um, two questions. One is what is your sensor preference uh, or what your sensor preferences are for field acoustic measures and why? So like from a, from a cost standpoint. And then two, how um, well was the piezo buzzer able to reproduce how accurately, I think is what she's asking, the psyllid signal in the lab from the, the work that you were showing earlier? Uh, okay, so the first question is, uh, I, d I don't necessarily have a really good answer because, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> a lot of what uh, I presented today was, was done uh, after, after this March when mm -hmm. the 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 pandemic and we couldn't go out and do field work anymore and and had to do just some laboratory stuff so i i've been able to to get a pds system and also a tree vibes system and did did some work at uh at my house with with pint jars of uh, of grain and flour, and uh, and most of what you see from that was was done just recently. I think my preference kind of is the tree vibe system, but as you might guess, it's a little bit more expensive. But it it's uh, I I was very impressed with the cleanness of of the signal. And uh, it's it's ease of use. But and now for the second question, how well was the piezo buzzer able to reproduce the psyllid signal? Okay. So there's uh, the the insects that use vibrations have a lot of different ways of producing their sounds. Uh, some vibrate their abdomens, some stridulate, and others are like the, the psyllids that I work with, which seem not so much to stridulate, but they'll vibrate their wings. And so you get a nice harmonic signal. And I have found from working in the lab that that you can fool both the males and females if you have about three or four of the harmonics of the wing beat, wing beat vibrations. So uh, they vibrate usually between about uh, 180 to uh, 250 hertz. Uh, they, they vibrate through wings at that, that rate. And, and then the harmonics then are, are two, three, four, five times that. 
and and you don't you, you don't even have to have uh, particular harmonics. It's just as long as you have uh, two or three of them that it will fool the the insects, and they'll they'll call and reply back. It's really cool to 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 do it in the lab, and uh, uh, I th I think that probably has impacts on what's going on in the, the brain of the insect. Uh, but it's, it's not something I've uh, been able to study much so far because they have small brains, as you might guess. I okay. think um, Jim from Hui sent a note uh, asking, what is the low frequency limit on your recording system? Um, okay, so in general, I, I would say that as you go, uh, as you go below 80 to 60 hertz, there's a lot of extra background noise. And um, you can you can avoid 60 hertz by not using AC, but and doing everything with the batteries. Uh, so there's, you know, particularly with the accelerometer, you can you can go down uh, down to just just a few hertz signals. Although I hardly ever <laughs> do that because uh, most of the insect sounds I am most interested in tend to be up up at at least a thousand hertz or, or more. And then what type of hearing sensilla do Asian citrus psyllids use? Well, they don't hear. In fact, I'm not even sure that the, uh, the uh, spotted lanternfly, I don't even I'm not sure that it hears. It, it probably just picks up the vibrations that are coming through the leaf and, and uh, branch surfaces. It, to, to have a hearing uh, organ, the insect has to be big enough to have a tympanum. Mm -hmm. so, your, so your opinion is they're probably using vibration. Do you have a sense for whether or not some of these might be um, might be responding to particle motion, like near field sound through scintilla somewhere in the body. Well, it it's possible, but I I think most of the insects that are do that are are in the diptera family. Uh, it, insects are hard to pin down, and 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 there are so many different species and types of behaviors. Uh, I, I would guess that the, the ones that have really thin, flexible antennae might, might have the possibility to pick up particle motion. Uh, so, so I'm guessing maybe some of the smallest ones, some of the, some of the psyllids maybe, but uh, but since they spend so much of the time uh, feeding on the plants, I, I think that that um, mo most of the signals they're picking up are, are through the legs. Thank you. I will circle back to one of your comments, I think, or questions you had earlier at the beginning of your talk, where you were speculating that we probably don't have palm trees in New Hampshire. And, I would concur that uh, unless Jen has some insights about this that I don't, I've yet to see a palm tree in New Hampshire yet. So. <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions? Out yeah, there was one more question. What oh. type of hearing scintilla do Asian citrus um, scintilla use? Oh, oh yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of yeah, they they do kind of hear through their legs with the, the uh, what do they call it the corded tonal organs, but but they don't have uh, 
I, I don't think it's likely that they pay much attention to what's coming through there. But I could easily be wrong. If they, if they do that, it's like the, the way the Drosophila and the mosquitoes do. The Johnston's orbits. We are, thank you. I think we are just about out of time and out of questions. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's perfect. You can't ask for, for anything more there. Um, Dan, I'll let you close it up. Thanks for uh, helping with questions, Jen. So Richard, we appreciate you you're coming uh, and sharing your science with us. I, I know the field of agroacoustics has got a lot of new uh, interest and in, in, um, practitioners out uh, trying to uh, test all kinds of solutions in a, a very applied context like, like Jen was pointing out. So we appreciate that you, you took some time today and shared a little bit about uh, your work. And uh, we, we certainly look forward to hearing more. I know you're, you're on the forefront down in Pennsylvania and, and some of the other quarantine states trying to find a solution to the spotted lanternfly. And, and uh, Richard and I have a shared interest. We have a, a, uh, an individual working with us now at the UNH who worked with uh, Richard and Baruch Rodi, the postdoc that's down there uh, uh, testing some of these solutions as we speak today. So appreciate uh, your talk. And uh, again, we invite everybody back the next second Tuesday of the month for our next seminar. We'll send out announcements uh, on that front and I look forward to hosting all of you again uh, in our next seminar. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bye. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Richard.